Hello, everybody. Welcome to our opening event for Memo Acton's Distributed Consciousness. And um, we, we're very happy to have you here tonight. And I will let you know also a little bit about the structure for the evening. We will have um, a short introduction by Amy Alexander, professor in the visual arts department. And then we'll have Memo's um, talk. And then afterwards, we'll have a short time for question and answer, for discussion. So uh, at that time, please feel free to come up and offer um, a response or ask a question. And we can have a, an engaging discussion. That's actually one of the really important aspects of what we do at Gallery QI. One of the reasons why we're doing what we do, uh, organizing these exhibitions, is to bring people together from different fields to facilitate some really interesting conversations among people who are working in various disciplines and fields of inquiry. And we see it really as a fertile space to bring people together, to have encounters that may not be possible otherwise when we're all in our more specialized um, disciplinary um, bunkers. And the works that we, the projects and artworks that we show at the gallery are really meant, um, are occasions for, for, for those types of encounters. So we're happy to be organizing one tonight and thank you for joining us. And uh, before we move on, I would want to say thanks to the whole team at Qualcomm Institute for uh, helping us stage this show and all of our shows, the leadership team, the AV events, communication and projects teams, uh, really uh, are, are instrumental in, in bringing all of this together and supporting this work. So. A big thanks to everyone at Qualcomm Institute for, for, for this. So without uh, taking up too much time, since we have a lot to do tonight, I will introduce now uh, Professor Amy Alexander. Yeah, thanks, Jordan, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. So we are very excited to be uh, hosting uh, the work of our colleague, uh, Memo Acton. And uh, to give you a little bit of background on Memo, uh, he's an artist, researcher, and a philomath from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, he works with emerging technologies and computation as a medium to create moving images, compositions, large-scale responsive installations and performances. Um, and his work be brings together uh, diverse fields such as biological and artificial intelligence, computational creativity, perception, consciousness, information theory, neuroscience, fundamental physics, cosmology, spirituality, ritual, and religion. As part of his PhD at Goldsmiths University of London, he specialized in expressive human-machine interaction and artistic explorations of artificial intelligence. Uh, and he's considered one of the world's leading pioneers in uh, that field. Uh, he has received the Pre Ars Electronica Golden Nika, which is a super uh, prestigious award in media art. Uh, he has exhibited and performed internationally at exhibitions including uh, the Grand Palais Artists and Robots and the Barbican's uh, More Than Human. His work has been shown uh, at venues internationally, including the Moscow Museum of Art, Shanghai Ming Contemporary Art uh, Museum, London's Royal Opera House, and many others. He's a frequent keynote speaker on topics including art, science, technology, and culture. And he served as a mentor and jury on numerous international awards. And he's collaborated with celebrities including Lenny Kravitz, U2, Depeche Mode, and Professor Richard Dawkins. Uh, in 2007, Memo founded the Mega Super Awesome Visuals Company, a creative studio spanning art and technology. Uh, in 2011, 
uh, with uh, two partners. This evolved into Marshmallow Laser Feast. And in 2014, after a string of hugely successful, influential, and large-scale projects, uh, he left MLF to pursue his PhD and to focus on personal work, collaborations, and research. And uh, we are honored that he has joined us in the Computing and the Arts faculty in the Visual Arts Department as of uh, 2020. So uh, without further ado, Memo Acton. Um, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, thank you all for coming here. And of course, thank you to the Institute uh, Qualcomm Institute for giving me the opportunity to show my work here uh, and organize this event. I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, so today I will talk briefly really only about this one project, Distributed Consciousness, uh, which is the work that I'm showing in the gallery. And I'll be talking about the themes behind this work and there's actually quite a lot of <coughs> topics here, so I'll try to get through it as quickly as I can. And I stand here before you today as a collection of over a trillion cells, over a trillion little intelligent semi-autonomous machines that are working hard to keep me alive. And they don't even know about me. They're just trying to keep themselves alive. And more than half of these little intelligent autonomous machines are not even human. Uh, they're mostly various kinds of bacteria. Yet somehow, out of the interaction of these trillions of little machines that are going by their little business, I emerge as an apparent, at least to me it feels that way, a single unitary I. Uh, a single entity out of a collection of these trillions of, of cells and other organisms. But I am actually even more than just the collection of those trillions of cells that comprise me. I am also every conversation I've ever had with everybody. I am every film I've ever watched, every book I've ever re uh, read, every scene I've ever seen. And in turn, every person I've ever interacted with is also a collection of a trillion cells and is also every person they've ever interacted with, every book they've ever read. So in short, I am a network, a massive network that spans all of space and all of time. And all intelligence is collective and collaborative. And this is really the the thread that I will try and um, weave today's presentation around. Before I dig into distributed consciousness, I'd like to begin <coughs> uh, just a few minutes covering some my, my general practice um, that I've been doing for the last couple of decades. And I think it can be summarized by this tweet uh, from almost 10 years ago now, when I realized that all of my work is either about waves or God, uh, and that somehow quantum mechanics unifies the two. And I wrote that in 20, uh, 2015. And looking back, I think now I realize that by waves, I was referring to the patterns in nature which we humans have collectively managed to recognize, decipher, and formalize into equations and theories that we sometimes even find elegant or beautiful. And by God, I think I was referring to those mysterious aspects of nature, which we have yet to understand, and the lengths that we go to, the stories we invent to try and make sense of it all. And by quantum mechanics, I think I was referring to the fringes of human knowledge, which we empirically know to be accurate and can understand through the language of mathematics, but we're not yet able to fully comprehend on a deeper level. So this is the space that I find myself oscillating in, exploring the tensions between technology, ecology, science, and spirituality. 
My work comes in different forms, sometimes interactive, sometimes not, almost always code-based. That's my craft, so to speak. I create large-scale immersive installations, architectural projections, smaller gallery-friendly work, tactile interactive installations, outdoor works, sound installations. I work with lights and lasers, with real-time control, interactivity. I collaborate with dancers and for example here, the dancers' movements control the lights in real time. So I work a lot with emerging technologies as a medium and a subject matter, thinking of these technologies as extensions of our body, as extensions of our mind, thinking about their impact on us as individuals, how we behave and express ourselves, and ultimately their impact on society, culture, ethics, law, tradition, ritual, and religion. I think about ritual and religion a lot, and I'm not referring to only the established traditional rituals, religions, or forms of spirituality, but new forms and their current evolved incarnations, new rituals and spiritual frameworks, new forms and places of worship, and the values enmeshed with the technologies that we're creating. I think of rituals as algorithms for the body and mind, and of course, the, the main theme which I'm working around a lot these days is the mind, the human mind, non-human minds, biological minds and synthetic minds. I've been working in this field known as AI for quite some time now, um, and I'm really interested in the technologies and the politics of the technologies, studying how AI has actually manifested itself today in our lives and the social and cultural implications of the path that it's on but I'm equally fascinated by a more speculative metaphysics of AI as reflections of ourselves, as reflections on how we perceive the world and how we make meaning, as a computational lens on trying to understand ourselves, the nature of the mind, and perhaps, eventually, even consciousness. So, thank you. With that out of the way, I will um, delve straight into distributed consciousness. Uh, this is a very multifaceted work that spans themes of biological and artificial intelligence, distributed computation, distributed cognition, cryptography, evolution, many other things which I'll, which I'll get to. Um, but also climate change, um, activism, and environmental awareness. So I'll start with discussing what the project is. Um, and how the work manifested itself, and then I'll discuss the themes and motivations behind the work. Um, it started out of an NFT collection, actually, in 2021, uh, and then I started doing a few installation versions. This was a version that I did um, in China in 2021. Uh, this was a version that I did in, um, in Melbourne just last year. I came back just a few months ago. Uh, and now the third iteration is right here at the um, QI gallery. So as I said, it began as an NFT collection um, on the ecologically friendly Tezos blockchain. Um, there's 256 of these tentacular critters, uh, 256, because that's to the power of eight, as we all know. Uh, and these images I created with AI. <clears throat> this is before tools like Midjourney and Dali existed. Uh, but the kind of seeds of them were there with things like Clip. Uh, so I created these using some custom software, and I started releasing them into the wild, spawning them, I called them. Uh, so every day I had it all automated. So every day uh, from October 16th to the end of October in 2021, 16 of these would be spawned. They'd be minted and released into the wild. Um, and quite... Fascinatingly, quite a community evol uh, evolved around them and collecting them and crazy bidding wars, and it, it, was, it was quite wild. I wasn't expecting it. Um, but a month after they were all sold out, uh, I revealed the secret that this was just actually phase one um, and that there was going to be a phase two. Uh, this was going, there was a reveal. And so I announced on Twitter <coughs> that actually every one of the images that people had collected, uh, every one of those critters that, I'd, that I had spawned, actually had some text cryptographically encoded in it. 
So there's text hidden in the image, in the pixels, uh, cryptographically, which is the kind of language of the blockchain, uh, that's invisible to the human eye, but readable by code. And this text was actually a manifesto, and every image was actually a verse from this manifesto. And this manifesto was also a co-creation with AI. Uh, this is before ChatGPT. I use GPT-2 and GPT-3. Uh, and it's uh, a two-hour-long meditation on topics spanning consciousness, free will, life, death, art, technology, ritual, sustainability, environmental awareness, and activism. So as part of this reveal back in 2021, I recorded these verses uh, as audio, as audiovisual readings, and uh, accompanying with these kind of gem-like things, and I released these as well. Uh, the whole, all of the verses, 256 of them, it comes to around two hours long. Uh, so I edited that down um, into a 20-minute kind of more concise version, and that's the version that you'll be hearing today. So in the gallery, you'll be seeing the critters animated, and you'll be hearing the verses. You'll be hearing a 20-minute uh, summary. Every sentence you hear is AI-generated. So I didn't edit the text. I just selected some verses. So you're hearing a selection of verses, uh, and you'll get an idea of the overall, the overall narrative. So I'll talk a little bit about the motivations behind the work. Um, and there's a few different threads that I'll start quite separately, and I'll try and weave them together. So this project was born during the pandemic. I was, I'd already been, I had just been hired by UCSD, but I was in Turkey, and my visa was frozen, so I couldn't come to the US, um, which I can't really complain, because I was in a small Mediterranean fishing village, and I'd go snorkeling every day, uh, and then do my Zoom teaching at night. <clears throat> so I'd go snorkeling every day, and I'd see octopuses almost every day. But usually they'd be three, four, five meters deep. That's um, 15 feet for you Americans. And at that depth, you don't really see color uh, because the, the seawater filters out most uh, frequencies of light. So they just always appear. Everything's bluish green. But one day I saw an octopus sitting on a rock just underneath the surface, just a few inches from the surface, under a full spectrum of sunlight. And it flashed at me the most intense, vibrant colors. And it completely blew my mind. Like pink, purple, orange, cyan. I had no idea they could be this vibrant. And that was the spark that ignited the mess of highly inflammable ideas that were in my brain but hadn't really coalesced into an idea yet. And so this was the spark that gave birth to what ended up being this project. Um, <clears throat> and some of these themes that were that loose mess at the time. So 2021 is also the year that NFTs exploded. Uh, the blockchain exploded, the crypto, crazy crypto lobby. And there's a lot to say about all of that, NFT and Web3, and whether it's the VC-backed extreme neoliberal, um, ne neoliberal libertarian values driving it, um, or the ecological nightmare that is Bitcoin, and at the time, Ethereum, when it was using the proof-of-work consensus algorithm. But I want to focus on something a bit different, a, a lot more speculative. So I've been working in AI for a few decades now, and it's really ex been exploding in the last few years. Obviously, in the last two years, AI has been huge. But even going back, this is the trend graph on Google, the Google News trend graph for the term AI. As you can see, there's a spike in 2012. That's related to cats. Um, true story. I can talk about it later. Uh, but really around 2015 is when AI explodes in the mainstream. And it just grows gradually until right now. It's obviously really, really huge. So yeah, around about 2015 is when it explodes. Um, and this is the trend graph for the term big data. We don't really hear big data a lot these days. But back in 2011, 2012, 2013, it's all we would hear about. It was just big data, big data. 
and that's about 2011. So I'm really fascinated by how, after a steady period of big data, we have AI. And this is not a coincidence, and there's many reasons why this is not a coincidence. Uh, one of my favorite reasons why is this rather provocative um, statement I made in 2014, consciousness is evolution solution to dealing with big data. Um, and I will expand on this slightly, um, especially thinking about when vision evolved roughly half a billion years ago, and it brought with it the selective pressure to reward organisms that could more efficiently utilize the limited neural bandwidth that they had when trying to decide what to do with the information they were receiving from the environment uh, with regards to evading predators or catching prey. And many believe that this may have even helped accelerate what we call the Cambrian explosion of the evolutionary arms race. And in more complex organisms, this may even include learning to model the environment in order to make uh, more efficient predictions about the environment and, and more intelligent actions in an increasingly complex world. And going even beyond that in many organisms to increase chances of survival, we can start modeling the idea of abstract entities with goals and desires. And we can do this also thinking of ourselves as one of these abstract entities and agents with goals and desires, living in a world full of other agents with goals and desires. So I can interact with any of you and predict and understand your actions, not thinking of you as a trillion cells, not thinking of you as waves in cosmic quantum fields, but thinking of you as an entity with goals and needs and desires that I can empathize with. In a sense, your consciousness is my interface to you. So I do like this metaphor relating the emergence of AI as a means of coping with big data, analogous to the Darwinian evolution of intelligence, and perhaps even consciousness as a means of dealing with big data in the natural world. And I wrote this in 2014 um, as a tweet and an article uh, uh, and as a blog post. Uh, and I'm very happy that Peter Godfrey Smith wrote a book in 2016 called Other Minds, which essentially unpacks, not that he saw my tweet, uh, but unpacks this hypothesis and backs it with a, with a, ton, of, um, a ton of data. But I'll get back to that shortly. So now I'm also really continuing this train of thought. I'm really fascinated by the rise of blockchain and in particular distributed world computers. So these are... Uh, networks, blockchain-based networks, where each node in the network has a full copy of the code and the data, and they're kind of autonomous. And I'm really fascinated by this as a metaphor for multicellular life, where every cell in my body has a copy of my DNA, is potentially capable of being any other cell, but somehow in a very distributed manner, with no central overarching controlling mechanism, through communicating with each other, they give each other roles. And so now I have nails, and I have eyes, and I have a liver. Um, even though they all stem, they're all somehow identical and later uh, separate like this. Three, distributed intelligence. More than half a billion years ago, the lineage that would lead to octopuses and the one leading to humans separated. Was it possible, I wondered, to reach another mind on the other side of that divide? Octopuses represent the great mystery of the other. Simon Montgomery, The Soul of an Octopus, 2016. So octopuses are known to be incredibly intelligent. Moreover, they have a radically different neurobiology and kind of intelligence to humans or even mammals or birds or any other animal that we're familiar with. The nervous system of a common octopus has around 500 million neurons, similar to that of a dog's. But unlike a dog, or any mammal, reptile, bird, those 500 million neurons are not concentrated in a central location, like a brain. Instead, they're distributed across the entire body of an octopus, with only 10% in a central brain and two-thirds in the arms. In fact, with more than 40 million neurons in each arm, almost double that of a rat, 
Each arm is able to act independently, even communicating with other arms without involving the central brain. Each arm is semi-autonomous, able to move, taste, taste, uh, touch, taste, smell and respond, even if severed from the body. With each arm having a quote-unquote mind of its own, the octopus has a very distributed intelligence, a very different kind of intelligence to the ones that we're accustomed to. To paraphrase the philosopher Thomas Nagel, what is it like to be an octopus? Or rather, what is it like to be an octopus's arm? Cephalopods are an independent experiment in the evolution of large brains and complex behavior. If we can make contact with cephalopods as sentient beings, it is not because of a shared history, not because of kinship, but because evolution built minds twice over. This is probably the closest we will come to meeting an intelligent alien. If we want to understand other minds, the minds of cephalopods are the most other of all. Peter Godfrey Smith. Other minds, the octopus, the sea, and the deep origins of consciousness, 2016. Quote, unquote, artificial intelligence. So I mentioned this trend graph um, with AI happening around 2015. Now, I also find it interesting that in 2015, we had this big explosion of AI. And in 2016, we had quite a number of mainstream books on cephalopods. Um, first came Soul of an Octopus by Simon Montgomery, which I've quoted from. Donna Haraway, Staying with the Trouble, Making Kin in the Thulu Scene. And finally, Other Minds by Peter Godfrey Smith. These are all really wonderful books in very different ways. And of course, none of these books are really about cephalopods. Instead, these books invite us to reflect on the nature of our relationship with non-human intelligences and consciousnesses that we share our planet with. They invite us to face the final Copernican trauma that is waiting ahead of us. Centuries ago, we had discovered what was exhilarating for some, but too painful for many to accept, that we are not the only planet in existence. We eventually realized that we are not the only solar system, we are not the only galaxy, and many of our smartest today even question whether we, whether we are even the only universe. Every one of these discoveries brought with it a realization that was exciting, liberating, and humbling for some, but terrifying and too painful for others to accept. This is a decentering of human exceptionalism, a Copernican turn, a Copernican trauma that pressured humanity into revisiting our perceptions on how we relate to the world, the cosmos, and its human and non-human living and non-living inhabitants. Distributed consciousness. With the rise of AI, we are now facing these age-old questions that we have pondered over for thousands of years through this new lens of computation. And cephalopods, with their incredibly advanced yet utterly intelligence, represents a great example of an already existing, non-human, alien, decentralized other mind. And now we face the ultimate Copernican trauma, the final decentering of human exceptionalism, where this time the arena of realization is not situated outside of us, but within. It is not regarding where we are in relation to the world, but who we are. We are now faced with the reality that we may not be the sole keepers of what we might consider to be intelligence, creativity, or even consciousness. Much simpler with the gift of hindsight, we can now see how the dangerous dichotomy of man versus nature, and I'm using gendered language deliberately here, has allowed quote unquote man to justify his subjugation, or at least attempts at, of nature. And today we are experiencing the devastating consequences of this manufactured divide as we face mass extinctions, global warming, and ecological collapse. So let us meditate on the interconnectedness of all human, non-human, living, and non-living things across manifold scales of time and space. Let us depart with despair and apathy in times of ecological collapse and urgency, and instead actively work towards multi-species flourishing. So normally I would play a few clips now, um, but since the gallery is open, we can later go there and see the work. Uh, you can see it for yourselves. So I think I will stop here and thank you for listening.
Okay. Thanks so much, Memo. Um, we want to open up for um, discussion with the audience. And I know, um, please feel free to come on down to one of the microphones on either side. Hello, Professor. I just came back from your exhibit. I found the diamonds to be interesting. They reminded me of what is, uh, for my generation, a bit of a meme relating to the biblically accurate nature of angels. And I wanted to ask you, what is your perception of what is traditionally considered God. Do you believe in some sort of what Christians see as the Holy Spirit or other religions see as a uni unifying force? Do you believe in that sense of consciousness or spiritua spirituality, or is it more of a materialist view in the way that you describe partly in the presentation of saying that what is God is those patterns or repetitions we see in nature that make us believe that there is something greater than us? Thank you for the easy question to start with. <laughs> um, could you repeat the, uh, the diamonds reminded you of a meme of what I missed that? Well, it's, I think for my generation, a lot of these grandiose concepts end up becoming jokes on the internet. So the, the idea of a biblically accurate angel, which is like okay. a, a eight wheels with like eyes spinning, is something that to us, uh, you know, we laugh at. But it is like, you know, if, if I was like, 30 or not th I'm not to say 30 but if I was like you know if I was my parents age like it'd be a much deeper concept but that idea I think because of social media it gets cheapened to a joke a lot of times okay. um, well 30 yeah. is very old I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you told me so okay I don't believe in the supernatural um, to, to answer your question Derek I don't believe in the supernatural um, anything that obeys the laws of nature is by definition natural. If it doesn't obey the laws of nature, um, well, I don't believe in things that don't obey the laws of nature. So I believe that I am not in the universe. I am part of the universe, that the universe is in me, that the matter that I am comprised of was born in supernova billions of years ago before it was spewed across the galaxy to momentarily come together to be me and you in this room and somehow through the interaction of those particles I am conscious how that happens I do not know um, but I think it obeys the laws of nature uh, I could go on a lot longer but I think that gives the gist of that answer Thank you so much, that was beautiful. Um, I'm kind of wondering about, it seems like a lot of the, some of the themes here are about like moving past human exceptionalism, kind of this like post-human thing going on. And I know that some like black feminist thinkers have argued that we're not really ready to move beyond human exceptionalism until like all sort of demographics achieve a full human status to begin with. So there's like a risk of flattening. Uh, so I just wondered if you could speak a little bit about that with regards to your work. Yeah, thank you. This is a very, very good point. And I've witnessed um, these kind of discussions as well. In, in essence, I can be accused of dehumanizing humanity when a large proportion of humanity are still fighting to have their humanity accepted um, and I'm and I'm very aware of this um, I don't think that I mean I, it's I, to be very clear I 
I'm fully accepting of that kind of viewpoint. And I'm not arguing that we sh when I talk about um, getting away from human exceptionalism, it really is a certain kind of human exceptionalism, which is also the kind of human exceptionalism that has led to the dehumanization of large populations. It's really about you know, a very extractivist, um, exploitative ideology, uh, which is about an exceptionalism of a very small subgroup of of humanity so I have a lot of respect for that kind of viewpoint that you share and I try to be sensitive to it and I don't believe it's incompatible if if there is an incompatibility that is only through a poor choice of language on my behalf I would say thank you but thank, thank you, you. Hi, Professor Acton, and I just have a quick question. So uh, in this pic picture, I can realize that um, in those octopus, there's so many combination of the features that is based on the, like to me personally, is like based on the non-Earth-based features of the creatures. I can see the, um, the sparkles and the lightning in those creatures. So I'm thinking that uh, are you inspired by the, um, alienism that is related to the octopuses because the reason why that this creature is so special is because the unique way that is functioning and it's not like a like human or mammals or any other creatures so i would like to think about i would like to know the way you're thinking about the alienism and the connection of it with the octopus yeah okay um thank you so yes yeah, some of these images do have sparks and things like that I guess when I was creating these images, I was thinking of, um, and also the installation in general, and if you, if you read the text about it, because I talk about it as a kind of almost a place of worship um, or a place of ritual, and I was thinking about, not necessarily alien, but rather how religions inform culture and values, uh, and we essentially get our even in a secular society, we live um, in the shadow of the religion that has been dominant. And, uh, you know, in Europe is arguably perhaps more secular in, in where I was living in England before. But still, it, you know, it's every aspect of society is shaped by the religions that has been controlling it. And so I was wondering if we had other kinds of faiths what kind of values might we have had? So in a way, I imagined these creatures as inspired by octopuses, but as, as deities. If these had been our deities, if we had a different religion, if, if we had a different um, faith system, what might our values, what might they have been? And what kind of world would we have been living in? So that was a kind of starting point. Um, and then I just played with lots of different aesthetics. Some of them do have kind of more lightning style things. It's not necessarily alien though. It's not a space alien thing. It's more mythology. So this is a kind of alternative mythology, let's say. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wonder if you, if you could reflect on how well we appreciate or understand consciousness. We've looked at this. You've made a really nice point about the independent 500 million year evolution that leads to species, the octocephalopods, and you know, um, let's say us. And um, that's that's a big divide. And in between that amount of time, there are millions of species that have gone extinct. And we don't really have the ability to understand whether they developed uh, consciousness or not. So there could be a whole universe of consciousnesses we don't um, appreciate. And um, I just uh, wonder uh, how we can approach uh, 
a more a fuller understanding, or if you have a view or a pathway to understand a fuller understanding, um, you know, uh, also given um, our cosmology, which is you say that these events have been going on for a long, long, long time. Yeah, thank you. Another simple question. Um, so I, I'm very interested in this topic, but of course I'm not a scholar in, in, in the study of consciousness. I will say it is a very interesting area of research. Um, I don't know, it feels impossible to try and make um, progress in this field. But then I'm reminded, I guess, making progress in understanding how life functions might have felt impossible uh, a few hundred years ago. I like prefer um, erring on the side of caution in the sense that assuming that, yes, animals are conscious. There was a time when the assumption was no, only humans are conscious, that animals have to prove themselves to be conscious. Um, whereas if we start the other way, particularly, I mean, maybe I'm getting very, um, a bit too pragmatic here, but if we think of mammals, which share an almost identical neurobiology as us, then it would be crazy to assume that, they're, that they don't have consciousness. But then going beyond that, uh, many other animals maybe don't have the identical neurobiology, they don't have maybe a neo neocortex, but they have a dorsal ventricular ridge, like what birds and reptiles do, which is maybe from some of the similar, similar actions, very reasonable to assume that they are also conscious. Octopuses share hardly anything in turn, well, they still share a very large portion of our DNA because they are still from that lineage, even though some people have proposed that they are maybe actually aliens. Um, that's a different story. But it is most likely that they have some kind of a consciousness, but of course a kind of consciousness which is impossible for us to understand, as, as I was um, kind of paraphrasing Thomas Nagel, who was imagining the consciousness of a bat, it's, it's impossible for us to, to, to imagine that. Um, I don't know if I can say more um, about that, but um, yeah, that's, I guess, where I stand on that question. Professor Dominguez, we're waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Um, one of the elements that I uh, find, again, um, almost in a strange binary of wave and God uh, that seems to be the performative matrix of um, the process by which you begin to think the making, uh, the crafting, right? It's almost invisible. Uh, what comes is then surprising. But in, in terms of the imagery and the impulse of the alien, of the octopi, um, of deities, that seems to also be part of this mythopoetics that you're developing as well, which is the merger of God and wave. So it's not a theological statement, uh, but it's a mythopoetic sensibility. And uh, I guess to touch on uh, the theorist that you mentioned at the beginning, uh, I think there was three, Donna Haraway, um, in one of the ways that she encounters distributed consciousness is uh, the Kahuthu scene, right? Different than the capital scene or the Anthropocene. And um, even though she denies that it's reflecting on this question, um, the Cthulhu scene carries with it the deities of empirical cosmic pessimism. That is, that we are driven to these mythopoetic systems, that we are driven to distributed consciousness because uh, there is no consciousness. There is no ultimate waves or gods. There's only a pessimism that it's difficult for us to do anything with, 
right? It's at the limit. Um, and so that you choose the kind of cosmic pessimism image, like the octopus, uh, that the Kathul Hussein uh, develops. It's not one in which the wave and the god are expansive, but it's that moment of consciousness, distributed consciousness, which assumes that it has a limit, that it has a, a finite space that can't be crossed. Um, because again, of cosmic pessimism, there are no life forms out there. there there's only us at this particular moment. Um, so the distributed consciousness um, creates this kind of hallucinogenic space of AI that is about the limits of what is consciousness and what is distributed. Um, and I, I find it all uh, deeply moving uh, to hallucinate with you that there is consciousness, that we can uh, distribute that consciousness. Um, because when I ride in my uh, car and I turn on the news, there's always an ad that says, we have a new AI system for the market, and we guarantee that it doesn't hallucinate. And that's part of the marketing of this new AI, right? No hallucinations here. But your work is, it is hallucinations, uh, driven by empirical knowledge, uh, big data, uh, code. But it's always about dreaming that there is something beyond cosmic pessimism, but the deities just keep coming back. Kathul Hussein says, no, there is nothing there except you. And we're not going to be here very long because of extinction. Um, I don't know why I'm rambling now, <laughs> other than I was told that this is what I needed to do <laughs> when I entered this theater. And so I think I've achieved that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I think you can respond in that way, any way you see fit. Um, one of the luxuries of being an artist is that hallucinating is part of our job description. So, um, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Hi. Uh, as I sit here hallucinating uh, with these images in front of me, uh, I see lots of puppies. Uh, I see Ganesh uh, at the bottom. Uh, so my question is actually about what it takes to generate these. Do you use a seed, which is what we hallucinate about? Uh, how long does it take to produce these images? Uh, okay. uh, Time-wise, energy-wise? Uh. So the, thank you for the question. These particular images um, are very easy and quite quick to hallucinate. I made them in 2021. Um, I'm using a pre-trained model. So this is before things like Midjourney and Dali. But at the time, there was a thing called VQGAN, which was, um, I can't remember, who, it's, it's, uh, some university w research thing. Um, so they trained the model. So that would have been very time consuming. And this is a, this is a big model. So like DALI or um, Midjourney, it's got everything in it. Uh, to actually generate the images is a few seconds. And it's text-based, so it, like Dali or Midjourney, it's um, you type in what you want. But the system I had developed for this was I would type in what I want, and it's generating. And then while it's generating, it's like iterations, I could move the image around, and I could type in something else. So I w it would be generating something, and I'd say, OK, now zoom in here and create an eye, um, or an, an, uh, an eye on a rock. So it was kind of like um, the, the computer's generating and I'm, you, it's generating in time and I'm telling it what to do. And so I guess maybe 10, 20 seconds, the whole <coughs> process of it iterating, me saying things, things like that. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, I have a question about the generation of the text. Oh, yeah. Which um, you speak of as a manifesto. 
And I'm wondering, uh, so you mentioned that it was written by um, GPT-2 and 3, but um, you had a role in that. Yeah. And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit about authorship and about the, um, the, the rhetorical form you know, that you used with, with the statements. Um, yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, this is a, 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 a very big topic, which I actually have a whole section in the presentation, but I didn't have time to get into around authorship. Because so the way I wrote the text was I had a conversation with GPT-2 and GPT-3, which are the precursors to chat GPT. And I would say something and it would say something. And I would copy paste huge chunks of text in um, just to steer its style because that kind of primes it for a particular style of writing. So I would copy a huge piece of text and then I would add my own paragraph at the end. So it would take the topic and the question from my text, but it would somehow be in that mindset of the, if you pardon the metaphor there, um, of the text before. So, th and I generated like many, many tens of thousands of words of text like this. And I edited that down to about 10,000 for the full thing. And when I say edited, I didn't touch anything that it generated. I wanted the text to be its own <coughs> sentences, but I just selected sentences and I reordered them. And sometimes I would take that paragraph and then this paragraph and they wouldn't link. It wouldn't flow nicely. So I thought I need a connecting paragraph. So I would try to get the GPT to generate a paragraph which would connect those two by prompting the, like, this is talking about maybe art. This is talking about life. So maybe something about emotion and what it means to be human. So then I would ask it questions about that to try and connect the link. And in the end, so the first, so I used GPT-2, which is an old model and it's small and it's not that great. I mean, when it came out, it was mind blowing, but I used GPT-2 because I wanted the beginning to feel quite um, naive and quite simple. And then I gradually used bigger and bigger models um, so even within GPT-3, there's like four different models, like Da Vinci and uh, things like that. So I gradually use bigger and bigger models so that the, by the end, it's very coherent. So it, it's the most coherent. And so the beginning bits are a bit wispy and waffly rather. But towards the end, even though it's not my sentences, I would stand behind everything that it says because it's my thoughts. Like that's what I wanted it to say, but it's not my my words. Now, who's, whose words is it? Whose style is it? Um, and this is where the idea of the distributed consciousness comes back in because it's everybody it's been trained on. Whoever it's been trained on is somehow in that data set. And this is, you know, uh, this is problematic for many reasons. Um, and I lost my train of thought. Um, what was I going to say? But anyway, so. It's not my language, but it's someone's language. Or maybe it's not one person's language, but it's a group of people's language. It, oh, it, it, I was going to say this. It came up with one sentence, which I really liked, which is um, the internet is not a bunch of computers connected to each other. It's a bunch of human minds connected to each other. And I quite like that phrase. And I thought, I wonder who said this? I, is it just quoting someone? And I searched the internet and I couldn't find out who said it. Um, oh, one thing happened. Like, this is really quite hilarious. Um, I was looking for a quote. Um, the gist of the quote, I know the, the gist of the quote is this. <laughs> um, you can't get to strong AI by stringing together a bunch of weak AI, meaning strong AI is this alleged dream that Silicon Valley tech bros have that we will have AI that is like a human. That's called strong AI. And some people try to get there by building these small AIs, weak AIs or narrow AI, and the criticism for this is you can't get to strong AI by just building bigger and bigger weak AIs. And I couldn't remember who said this quote or what the quote was, because this isn't the quote. And I asked ChatGPT, who said this? And it said, oh yeah, the quote is, um, you can't make a souffle out of stacking a bunch of pancakes. And it was Marvin Minsky who said this. And I thought, oh, okay, that's a beautiful, I don't remember that quote, it's a beautiful quote, and it does sound like something like Marvin Minsky would say, but I 
don't I mean I've read a lot of his work I don't remember it so I asked where did he say this and he said in um, Society of Mind or whatever that book was I said I don't remember it in that and so I searched I couldn't find it and I asked ChatGPT are you sure Marvin Minsky said this and he, I said oh no I'm sorry it was like Hofstadter I'm like okay that sounds like something like Doc Hofstadter would say but um, where did he say this and he said oh no no it wasn't it was John Searle I'm like, okay it sounds like something John Searle would say but in the end, it said, I'm sorry, I, no one said it. So <laughs> this quote, you can't make a souffle by stacking pancakes, I searched, it doesn't exist. Chat GPT made this up. Um, but I loved it so much that in the chain of authorship, and I tweeted this, I was, I was live tweeting this whole exchange, I'm the last human. So does that make me the author? Because... If you trace it, I'm the human, the last human where it, where it gets to. Long story short, authorship is very complicated. Um, and again, going back to the very beginning, all knowledge is collaborative and cooperative, but we live in a culture and society which embraces heroes. And every aspect of our culture just worships heroes. Every film that comes out of Hollywood is about heroes and heroines. Um, whereas that is not the nature of knowledge and knowledge building. Um, and um, in a way, AI is reminding us of that, but it sucks that it's being made by these corporations whose very goal is to maximize profit. And that's where it gets uh, quite complicated as well. But I think I'll stop there because I've been talking a lot. I've um, kind of got a follow up to okay. that. Okay, so we're kind of talking about that distributive consciousness and lack of authorship. And we're talking about uh, this idea of hallucination, which really means the AI got it wrong. It made something up. It lied. It gave us misinformation. And, and also this idea of we can't conceive of there being anyone out there but ourselves that we know about. But at the same time, the elephant in the room is all of this aggregate data consciousness uh, is very intentionally being seeded with disinformation. So how do how do we think about about that when the AI hallucinates and and it's it's hallucinating something that we think is based on our consciousness, but it's no one's consciousness. It, it's just fabrications to some extent. Um, that's a good question. I mean, ultimately, when we say AI. Of course, it's, it covers many, many different things. Yep. But for the purpose of this argument, we're talking about probably the current generation yep. of these like models, like la large language LLMs, models, yep. et, et cetera, things like that. Um, really, I think of these things as a kind of distillation of information. Um, and the current generations of LLMs are, are, are quite problematic in the way that they, I mean, on many levels, but even just the way that they produce one token at a time. Um, but there's still a lot of information stored in this model. And I think that's really interesting. Um, it's kind of like a next generation search. I think of it as a next generation search where you can ask Google something when Google was around or InfoSeq or Lycos back in the day. It was groundbreaking. We had all this information out on the internet. How do you get it? Um, and now the next step of that is something that mediates that and organizes that information and distills it in a way that is more accessible. Now, where it sucks is the people who are creating this, they're not doing it because they want to give you the best information as accurately as possible. Although some might, like Khan Academy, uh, famously... Uh, when ChatGPT came out, announced that they would be incorporating this kind of technology. And I, I love Khan Academy. Like, I, I owe a lot to Khan Academy. I did all the maths and physics and everything on, 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 on biology on there. So when someone like um, Sal Khan says, I want to incorporate this technology, I, I love it. Um, when Zuckerberg says it, I, I get shivers. <laughs> so... <coughs> um, yeah, the, I mean, it is being... So there was an actually a study that came out of Harvard um, about a couple of months ago around the disinformation. Uh, and this was around the time when um, Israel and uh, Hamas were, uh, you know, that was breaking out. 
And according to this study, because obviously there's a big fear about deep fakes, uh, and according to this study, the Harvard researchers concluded that actually AI isn't contributing to misinformation because people are already committed. Like the people have already picked a side. They don't need AI to be convinced of their side. A really, really bad Photoshop job or a really completely unfounded um, tweet is enough. So that was interesting. I don't know if it's, uh, there's more truth to it. But I don't know if that answers your question or if you want to go in different directions. Kind of. I mean, I, I think the difference between, uh, you know, an LLM and Google search is sourcing, right? Like if, uh, you do a Google search, you get the source of the information, the authorship is there. Whereas the, if the LLM hallucinates, you don't know, where is it pulling from? Is it reliable or is it disinformation or is it, you know, some, somebody that uh, had good intentions but put misinformation out there? Um, yeah, that, that absolutely. Not transparent. That, that's, that's an absolute problem. In a way, um, one, like th there's a certain thing which it's good for. Uh, what I, like I use ChatGPT almost on a daily basis. And what it is good for is for things which you can confirm easily. T to give a very, very geek reference, it's a bit like the, um, if there's any computer scientists in the room, N is MP thing. Anyway, I won't go there. Um, basically, questions which you can validate. Yeah. Like I was looking for, um, I remember a story about people, smoke, uh, people experimenting with non 24 hour days. Uh, and I remember clearly in a book <coughs> describing someone smoking a cigarette at 3 a.m. at night because they were living a 26 hour day. They were experimenting with this cycle and they were drifting out of sync with the daily, with the daily cycle. And I, there's no way I could Google for this. W what book was this in? Because it's just a, s a small story. I asked ChatGPT, I said, what book was it where they were talking about this in just one chapter as just in passing by this? And it suggested, oh, is it um, something about sleep? I'm like, no, no, it wasn't that book. I haven't read that book. I said, well, well, it was about something. And I explained what it was. And I said, oh, it could be um, Chaos by James Gleck. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've read that book. It could be that. So I go to Google Books. I open James Gleck's um, Chaos, and I s type searching, and it was that book. So if you can validate, yeah. it, it's a mind-blowing yeah. way of accessing information that you so. can't via any other search. Yeah. No. Do we have uh, either question? Otherwise, we'll <coughs> wrap up. Yes, one more. I just had a one quick question. Uh, this whole talk made me think of cyborgs. Um, we mentioned Donna Haraway. Uh, and this idea of like distributed cognition where we kind of think through the tools that we use, maybe storing information in paper or our phones or extending our abilities with pencils or something like that. Um, some might draw the line of like cyborg uh, with those tools alone. Some might draw the line with language use, uh, some with uh, actual biological integration with, with technology. And I'm, I'm wondering, like what that, how that notion uh, might relate to your, to your art, and specifically in this, uh, this exhibition, um, and also, yeah, your thoughts on that, on that divide between uh, human and non-human, and uh, integration between the two. Okay, yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, <clears throat> so, words like cyborg are also human inventions. They're also artificial categories, and. In a way, of course, you know, we were cyborgs when we started externalizing all any cognitive faculties. Um, where I, I don't really draw a line, as you say, you know, some might draw a line where it's within this artificial boundary that we call skin, which again, I say artificial because I am not just inside of this. I cannot exist with so many things that are outside of this. So I am in a way all of this. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think about the boundaries, uh, but one thing you mentioned, which I think is really interesting, is what externalizing certain processes does to us. That I think is really interesting, and that's not um, 
just a matter of where we arbitrarily draw lines, but actually when we externalize our memory through writing, uh, this has a neurological impact on us. Uh, like I, I, ca I can barely finish a book now. I used to sit down, read a book in a day, the next day read another book. Now I can't even read an article. I'm reading 10 books at the same time. And then my phone, like, there's neurological <laughs> changes happening within us, all of us, because of the technologies that we're using. And we started offloading memory. We offload cognition now. You know, we, we use these things for quite heavy cognitive tasks. I also, on a, on a separate, complete tangent, I find it fascinating that we started offloading our cognitive um, f tasks to devices or media that we would have with us, like stones or books or paper or computers. But now we offload it to the cloud. We call it the cloud. So I find this metaphor mind blowing that in the context of speaking about gods and rituals and religions, that we even call it the cloud, that we have the cloud watching us watching over us, protecting <laughs> us, uh, and we feel safe when we know that the cloud is watching us. Um, but going back to your question, I do f one question I don't know the answer to is with the current generation of AI that we have, particularly the image makers like Midjourney, we are offloading imagination. We no longer need to imagine the final product. I can just say, I want a nice piece of music like Chopin and it gives me 10 choices. And I say, I don't like that, I don't like that, I like that. Um, I said, give me 10 more like that. And it says, okay, here's 10 more. I said, I don't like that, I don't like that, I like that. And so I didn't have to imagine that piece. So I'm not really composing, I'm curating. Like that's what a, a curator might do. And as we move towards this mode of production, um, not everybody will. I'm not arguing that, you know, art's going to die. I'm not saying any of that. I don't think it will. But as we move towards this and this becomes more and more um, prevalent, especially when we live in an environment of like TikToks and Instagrams where they're already, like the TikTok algorithm blows my mind. I, I open a new account every couple of months just to see how quickly it can learn my preferences. And it's very quick. So the TikToks, the Instagrams of ten, 10 years in the future will just be feeding you content that you're imagining that you want. And when this is pushed to kids, um, yeah, I wonder what the, the Faustian bargain that we're doing, taking, signing is with regards to externalizing imagination um, in an environment of extractivist, exploitative, capitalist world that we live in. Otherwise, I love the tech. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll end there. I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, let's give a round of thanks to Memaro for uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Um, please um, uh, feel free to mingle for a while. We have a buffet. And also to join us in the exhibition itself. And feel free to also have talk with Memo. Thank you.